Good morning. Today is a wonderful Sunday as we jointly celebrate Sanford Sunday and Martha Stearns Marshall Month hosted by Baptist Women in Ministry. I would like to say a few introductory words about our special guest, Victoria Lawson. Um, Victoria Lawson is a native of Wilcox County, Alabama. She comes to us today as, as a junior religion major at Sanford University. She has had her share of trying to find her place in life for majoring in nursing, public policy, and has even pursued a career in music. Um, as she journeys on this holy path, she hopes to become a better leader and role model for all. Her own experiences of life have shaped her heart for leading young people to Christ with love and desire to help them discover their God-giving purpose, all while living out loud for Jesus. We are excited to have Victoria with us this Sunday, and I know that we at Williams will do a wonderful job of encouraging her. As we come together for worship on this bright February morning, let us enter into a time of prayer. Great and wonderful God, as we come into this place this morning, yearning to hear your voice, we gather for worship and sing songs of praises and thanksgiving to you. We come before you now and we sacrificially offer our time, our hearts, our minds, our very beings, so that we will be filled up and emptied again in your name. Take our humbled hearts and open them so that we can clearly see you and hear you. For it is the sight and sound of you, O oh God, that molds us into becoming more like your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning again, everybody. Y'all, I'm just so excited to be here. So if I start smiling a lot, like, I'm not crazy. I'm just really excited to be here. Um, thank you all for having me. And we'll just, we'll jump right in. Um, so if you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, um, the scripture is going to come from Luke chapter 17. We're going to start at the 11th verse. I'll give you a second to find it. If you got it, say I got it. Okay, this is when I got it. <laughs> All right. And it reads, As Jesus went to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood at a distance. They lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice, glorifying God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, were not the ten cleansed, where are the nine? Were there not any found to return and give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise, go your way, your faith has made you well. If you will bow for, with me for a word of prayer. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for an opportunity to come together and just lift up your holy name. Lord, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart is ever acceptable in your sight. God, I pray that your word goes forth and it touches who it needs to touch and that in some way we won't leave here the same. We will leave here a little bit better, a little more encouraged and go into next week knowing that you are with us. God, it's these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I like to use for a thought today, how to move the hand and the heart of God. How do we move God's hand and how do we move his heart? As Jesus went to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a the village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood at a distance and they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have pity on us. The first way that we can move the hand of God is by simply being unashamed. One day when I was a little girl, my um, uncle had this huge bag of gummy worms, and he sat across from me devouring the bag. I mean, he was taking them down, y'all. And then, just as he was about to finish them off, he looks over at me and he goes, you want some? And I'm thinking, yeah, I want some. I mean, what, what eight, nine-year-old kid doesn't like gummy worms? And then what he said to me next stuck with me for the years to come. He looks at me and he says, if you want something, baby, you got to learn how to ask for it. 
He says, you've got to learn how to ask for it. Say something. Even Jesus understood this principle. He told his disciples in, in Matthew chapter 7, he says, if you ask, then it'll be given. If you seek, then you'll find it. If you knock, then the door will be open to you. For only to those who ask, well, they're the ones who are going to receive. And only to those who knock, where well, they're the ones that the door will be open. And to only those that seek, they are the ones who are going to find it. But you have got to say something. We have got to do something first. As he entered a village, these leprous men, they met him. And we don't know why Jesus was going into that village. And I really don't think the lepers had an appointment with him. But when they saw him, they recognized an opportunity. And though he may be on his way to another miracle, I am so grateful that he is a God of interruptions. He will stop to perform one just for you. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus was on his way to heal Jairus' dying daughter when the woman with the blood issue reached out for him and she received her healing. Jesus wasn't out and about looking for people to heal. And like the lepers, this woman saw an opportunity and she took it. As I think about being unashamed of calling out for Jesus, the words of this beloved hymn comes to mind. It says, pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Even while on others thou art calling, please don't pass me by. Don't let Jesus pass you by without saying something. Even if you came to fix something for somebody else, don't forget about me. Even if you're on your way to just do something for somebody else's situation, I will say something. Just please don't pass me by. Don't allow your environment or your surroundings to allow you to suffer in silence and miss a breakthrough. Verse 12 tells us that as he entered the village, the men met him. And y'all, we've got to learn how to meet Jesus too. The men met him and they cried out with a loud voice. Now, this wasn't a subtle, a little cute cry. No, not only did they meet him, but their cry matched their condition. And as I think back to the Sunday before my very first class at Sanford, it was my first weekend in the city of, of Birmingham. And I went to this church that I had heard about and as the service ended, the pastor said, he says, hey, don't leave here the way you came. You know the speech. Bring your burdens to the altar and leave them there. And all that I tossed and turned about the night before suddenly hit me all at once. The enemy said, you know what, Tori? That's my name, by the way. He said, you know what, Tori? Don't get too comfortable. Don't go around smiling and talking to people at school because you won't be here long. Well, you know, the money is due in five days for tuition. You don't have it. Your parents don't have it. The enemy said, you know what, better yet, why are you even here? Shouldn't you be somewhere trying to figure out how you're going to pay these people? And all of that hit me at once. And before I knew it, I cried out right there in the middle of about 1,500 people that I had never seen a day in my life. I did not know the lady on my left, and I had never seen the brother on my right, but I needed God. And I didn't allow my surroundings to hinder my breakthrough. Now, this may not be for you if your life has always just been a bed of roses and Jesus sits on your couch and whenever you need him, he just shows up and fixes things like that. But there may be about 10 of us who knows the feeling of complete depletion all too well. When you're just all out of options and you've done all that you know how to do and all that you've got is a cry out that says, Lord, have mercy on me. If the lepers aren't enough, we can take a few pointers from Peter. I love Peter. Peter's my kind of guy. In Matthew chapter 14, Peter exercises his faith. The disciples see Jesus walking on the water, and they get scared. And Peter says, well, Lord, if it's you, bid me come out there too. And Jesus is like, come on, Peter. So Peter steps out of the boat and onto the water. And as he's making his way to Jesus, he starts to focus on the wind instead of the one who controls the wind. Don't we do that sometimes? And his faith starts to waver. And the Bible says that he begins to sink. Then notice what Peter says. Peter doesn't start some long, super religious prayer, dear God of Abraham, Isaac, father of the universe, all that good stuff. No, he just cries out. He says, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reaches out and catches him. Say something. He won't let you drown. And like the lepers, if you have the faith to go, he's not going to let you down. These men were desperate for whatever Jesus had to offer them, however he had to offer it. They didn't consult with each other. 
They just cried out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Don't be ashamed because of your surroundings and allow your cry to match your condition. The second way to move the hand of God is by faith and uncomfortable inconvenience. Faith and inconvenience. Nobody likes to be inconvenienced. (laughs) When he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice, glorifying God, and fell down on his face at his feet, thanking him. And he was a Samaritan. A simple truth that still blows my mind is the fact that Jesus sees us. He sees you and he sees me. When I go home and I close the doors, he sees me. When I log off of social media, he still sees me. When I'm not around everybody else, he still sees me, unfiltered, just as I am. And in all of our wretchedness, our broken spirits and our contrite hearts, he sees us and he heals us. But here's the thing, he cannot heal who we pretend to be. People see the outside, but God, he sees the part of us that nobody ever does. You know that part when people ask about our lives and there's always that one chapter we kind of leave out? Yeah. He sees us and he heals us. And in our cry for mercy, he tells us not to go to the priest, but to go and to sin no longer. When we take that step of knowing that we've been forgiven and we begin to walk in that, not only are we cleansed with the blood of the Lamb, but we are new in Christ and we begin to reflect that in our Christian walk. The scripture says, and as they went, this is my favorite part, y'all, and as they went, faith is active. Faith without works has no effect. Just like a car without gas is not going to do you any good. It has no effect effect. And as they went, they were healed. Not when they got there or after the priest checked them out or after he signed their release papers, but as they went. And we can't deny the awesomeness of Jesus in scriptures such as this. John chapter 2 gives us a similar experience to the power of Jesus' words. Jesus and his moms and his friend, they're hanging out at a wedding in Cana, and Mary comes to Jesus, and she's like, hey, baby, they're out of wine. And Jesus is like, I don't have anything to do with us. And Mary tells him, he says, hey, she says, hey, whatever he tells y'all to do, do it. Isn't that just like a good mom? Just kind of lays down the law and walks away, no explanation. Yeah, that's, that's my mom. In verse 7, Jesus tells them, he says, hey, fill the water pots with water. In verse 8, Jesus says, draw some out. Verse 7, he says, fill the water pots with water. Verse 8, he says, draw some out. Verse 7, they're putting water in water pots. By verse 8, They're drawing out wine. Jesus doesn't need an in-between. He didn't need to touch it, mix it, say abracadabra, shake it up, wait 10 minutes. No, he just does it. And Jesus doesn't have to be present physically to intervene on our behalf. He's at the right hand of God interceding for us daily, not when we think we need it or when we feel the need to repent, but daily. See, what I like about these lepers is they had hope, unseen hope, and that's a Little more than I can admit I sometimes have. In Romans chapter 8, it tells us that hope that we see, well, that's not really hope at all. For why would a man hope for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we don't see, we will wait for it. We will wait patiently for it. We move God's hand when we hope in what we have no evidence for. When every logical explanation says, it's not going to work, but something in our crazy little Christian minds say, but God. And we go for it anyhow. But as you go for it, don't forget to come back. Never forget what God has done in your life. Don't neglect the giver for the gift. When this one man saw that he'd been healed, he came back. And he didn't come empty-handed. He came back with a praise. And we've got to learn to praise God with the same heart, with the same intensity that we cried out to him with. We must recognize when we are in his presence. This ex-leper threw himself at the feet of Jesus. Being at someone's feet, it was a, it was a posture of servanthood, of, of emptiness. And I'll tell you a secret if you promise not to tell anybody. It costs nothing to say thank you. Not a thing. And I'm sure like me, you wonder, well, couldn't he have thanked God in his heart or whispered a little prayer like the other nine? Yes, but he showed his gratitude in action when he inconvenienced himself and turned back. 
Now imagine what God can do in our lives when we slow down and put our agenda on the back burner and we realize that we lose no time when we are serving the author of time. If we just pause, take a minute, turn back, say thank you, put the phone down or put the laptop down and to wait and hold the door or to put somebody else's needs before our own. For you do realize that we bless God and we thank God not only in our private prayer and secret devotion, but through our service to others. And Luke, he doesn't neglect to mention who this man was, and he was a Samaritan. He was a stranger among the Jews, and they had no dealings with this kind. This outsider acted more like a thankful child than the actual heirs did. And up until this point, all we knew was that these men were lepers. We knew nothing of their families, their religious backgrounds. Nothing about them was unique. Nothing separated them from each other. And I never understood why people get all worked up and uptight about race and religious affiliations and socioeconomic statuses when... We're all just like the lepers. And what binds us together is our common need for Jesus. And it should be far greater, and I do mean far greater than anything that could ever separate us. So we move God's hand by one, not being ashamed. Two, with our faith and our willingness to forfeit our comfort and be inconvenienced. Lastly, we move God's heart by understanding that he is not obligated to go the extra mile. Jesus said, we're not ten cleansed, where are the nine? Were there not any found to return and give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Can I suggest to you that God has a heart for grateful people? Jesus knew how many men he'd healed. He didn't miscount. He says, well, listen, I healed ten. There's only one here to account for it. Well, where's, where's everybody else? And Jesus asked this rhetorically. He knew exactly where they were. However, he never neglects an opportunity to teach us. And I believe this question was meant to transcend 2,000 plus years to reach us here today. The question is for me, not am I one of the nine, but which one am I? If heaven holds a prayer meeting every morning, and it starts when I open my eyes, and the angel shouts, she's up, y'all, she, she's up. Are they waiting on me to show up? Is my name accounted for on the roll? If God hosts a grateful people's conference at the end of every day, and as I prepare for bed, the angel shouts, she's done, she's done, she's here, she's finished, y'all. Are they waiting for me? Where are you today? Have you gotten what you came for and left? Did you show for the free stuff and leave after your ticket was pulled? Who's on that list at the Grateful People's Conference? Is it that young single mother of two who can't decide between buying food or paying her electric bill? Is, is she there? What about the young man who made poor decisions and he finds himself in prison? Is he there at the Grateful People's Conference? Maybe that one guy, and I mean we all know that one guy who never comes to church except for Easter and Christmas, and we may see him one or two times in between, but... Oh, no, he can't be there because I'm here every Sunday when the doors open and I volunteer and I go to the Bible studies. Well, Matthew chapter 7 warns us that not everybody who cries, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but it's those who do the Father's will. In other words, it's not everybody who goes through the motions of this thing called Christianity, but those whose hearts are in the right positions. And is your heart in the right position today? I have such an admiration for the newcomers in the faith. For the most part, they have such a fresh and a new view of God, and they are excited about God. And then there's us. I'm sorry, then there's me. I'll take this one for the team. Then there's me. I go to all the youth conferences and all the young adult things and the Bible studies. You know us. I mean, me. Sit on the front pew with my big study Bible, bright highlighted yellow pages. I'm there. It's me. And then there's us. I'm sorry, there's me. I'll take that one again. I lie in bed at night, strolling through social media while simultaneously meeting my 45-second prayer quota so that I can sleep better at night. Um, have we become so comfortable 
with knowing the master that we fail to really spend time with and discover and uncover his new mysteries. Are we the Jews that got what we needed and went off hoping to be socially accepted again by peer priests? Did we leave the one who bore for us our griefs and carried our sorrows, standing there looking, just waiting for us to return? An attitude of gratitude makes the difference. In this, we find that we are blessed, but it's not because of our obedience to the rules, but it's in a sincere desire to please the heart of God, even if we received nothing in return. God will never leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. And as his children, he has promised to supply all that we could ever need, but it's not because he owes us anything. I love Eugene Peterson's message version of this last line. Jesus tells the man, get up, period, on your way, period. Your faith has healed and saved you, period. What that ex-leper received on that day was more than just a cleansing of his physical ailment. It was an extended hand to join the family of God through salvation. After God has blessed you and you've given due thanks, get up and go. Get up and live, period, knowing that you have been cleansed and you have been forgiven and nothing, and I do mean nothing, can ever separate you from that love that has been extended to you through Christ. If the peer priests of your life don't declare you a new creature, well, that's okay. Live anyway, knowing that you have been cleansed because Jesus has declared it. What made this Samaritan noteworthy of this attention in Luke's gospel? After all, didn't they all cry out with an unashamed voice and ask for what they wanted? Weren't they all healed? The Samaritan went back with unseen hope in his heart, and he inconvenienced himself. This moved the hand of God. However, when he gave thanks and he realized that God didn't have to do it and that it was not about him, it never was. When he recognized God in all of his glory, this this moved the heart of God to extend the right hand of fellowship and call him his own. There are lots of Christians who do the right things, who live in their nice little Christian boxes and don't bother anybody and help others when it's needed and stick to the status quo, and life is okay. And my brothers and sisters, that is just fine. That is just fine. And then there's the thought that I have of getting to heaven and, and God lights up the big screen and he says, Victoria, you did you did okay. You did pretty good. You were nice to people. You prayed for people in the comfort of your own home. You were just the right kind of Christian. You got by okay. Good job. And then he turns and he lights up the skies and he says, but this, this is what I had for you. Had you only returned to thank me. If you'd only gone the extra mile and inconvenienced yourself for my name's sake. If you'd only pursued my heart the way you sought after my hand. So go back today and tell him thank you. For those of you who are in school, if it was only for understanding the material in class, tell him thank you. If it was only because you know you should have had a stressful day and you had more stuff to do than hours to get it done, but somehow there was a peace that just surpassed your understanding, tell him thank you. To be able for me just to call my mom and dad and they can answer the phone, I tell them thank you. To be able to call my grandma and my granddad and they can pick up the phone and I don't have to go by a cemetery to visit them, that is enough for me to say thank you. To be here today in my right mind, knowing there were days that I questioned if life was even worth it, if it was even worth living, I have to tell him thank you. And it's not because he doesn't know we're thankful or because he needs our validation, but I believe sometimes he just wants to hear it from his children. And we should aim to see God, to really see him, not physically but spiritually aim to see him to see who he really is then we will seek to move his heart and his hand is sure to follow god i thank you for these people i thank you for the word i pray that it goes forth and it does all that it needed to do that it doesn't return void God, I just thank you for being all that you are. I thank you for loving us in spite of. I thank you for giving us chance after chance after chance after chance, even when we don't return to say thank you. But God, I pray that you would just be with us as we go forward in this week. God, just continue to wrap your loving arms around us. Keep us in your keeping care, God. Keep us and we will be kept. Bless us and we will be blessed. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.